Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Tim Scott. <laughs> Good afternoon, Frimley. Wow, look at you. What a turnout. Now, a few of you might recognize this venue from the old days, but we've never had it this full. It's absolutely packed and it's sold out in a few days. So thank you for coming. And also a big thank you to our fantastic candidates who will be speaking later, and also to our county organizers. The response that we've had in this campaign has been absolutely unprecedented. So thank you so much for your support. So it's great to see so many people here. You know, we've been on a journey, a very exciting journey, and you've been part of it. So thank you so much for that. Okay, so part of my job is to introduce the speakers, but also just to get the ball rolling. So I'm going to ask a few questions and ask for a show of hands, just so we can make sure that we are at the right conference. <laughs> okay, so conference. First question, should we by now have left the European Union? Yes! I think we are at the right conference. Okay, so Theresa May said 108 times in the Houses of Parliament that we would leave when? 29th of March, absolutely. Okay, good. Okay, second question for you. Do we trust Labour and the Tories to deliver the Brexit the country voted for? I, I, think we're, I think we're definitely at the right conference. Okay, thank you. So, a show of hands, just raise a paw. Uh, who here is a registered supporter? That's looking great. Thank you so much, folks. We've had 100,000 people sign up. And at the rate we're going, we will soon overtake the membership of the Conservatives. And... <laughs> And at, and at 25 pounds a time, when we get all these stupid questions about where our money comes from, I think we can tell them that, can't we? 100,000 times 25 is a lot of money, so that's great. So my second question then is, who has already voted by postal vote? Who's already voted? Fantastic. And is anybody coming to the rally in London on Tuesday at Olympia? There's still a few tickets left. The capacity will be about double this, so it'll be great. There's still a few tickets left. That is the final rally. And then, folks, let's have another show of hands. Who's going to vote for the Brexit party on Thursday? OK, fantastic. So, folks, how about this? This Thursday, the 23rd, why don't we make it the end of May? I thought you'd like that one. And you know, we've got all these people saying, we want a so-called people's vote. We want, they, they say they want a, what are they calling it now? A confirmatory referendum. What hypocrisy. They don't want Brexit confirmed, they want it scrapped. So to the people, to the people who say, we must have a people's vote, I think we can very safely say, no problem, there's one on Thursday. Yeah. So it's been a great journey. We've done in a few weeks what it has taken other parties years. We have built the road, we've built the road as we've traveled it. And talking of building roads, you always need a steamroller, don't you? And we're hoping that steamroller is going to arrive on Thursday. And you have been part of that journey. Thank you so much. So for us, this isn't about right or left. It's about right or wrong. Our very democracy is on the table. And if they think they can fob us off with some dodgy deal, 
that will leave us tied to Europe for years with no say, then we're here to tell them, you've got another thing coming. We're not going to accept that, are we? No. OK, good, good. So I think, I think we've got it right that we're at the right conference. OK, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your support. We couldn't have done this without you. OK, so we've got a great lineup of candidates for you today. Our candidates have been very hard working. They've been all over the place. Our county organisers, I know, have been rushed off their feet. So uh, it's been great. So, but before we introduce our first candidate, if the technology is ready, we'd just like to show you our launch right. video. That is why I set up the Brexit party. It's why we're going to fight the European elections on May the 23rd. And that is just the beginning of what is needed in this country. Democracy is under threat. And when politicians fail to deliver, there must be consequences. I was too young to vote in 2016, but now I support the Brexit party because I believe in delivering on democracy. It's time to recognise that actually we are an incredible nation. This isn't about left or right. We are standing up for our right to be heard. Successful, hardworking, so much to be confident, enthusiastic and optimistic about. That's why I'm supporting the Brexit party. We are a single nation. We wish to remain a nation. They must adhere to the promises made to the people. Let's be optimistic. And for the benefit of our children and grandchildren, if you want a home and you're a Brexiteer, you join the Brexit party now. can do so much better than currently we're getting from our members of parliament. We want to be an independent, self-governing nation, making its own laws, controlling its own borders and being proud of who we are as a people. Join us, help us, support us, do what you can for us. We need change in this country and we need it now. Britain needs the Brexit party and the Brexit party needs you. Fantastic fantastic output output that we've had from, from our audiovisual team and on social media. Absolutely brilliant. Well done, folks. Well done. So, are we ready to hear from our first candidate? Yes. Okay, so. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I like that. I like that. Okay, so he works in business. He's got a family retail business. He's been campaigning out on the road. Camberley, Isle of Wight, Slough, Oxfordshire, he's been all round the region. He says he is campaigning against a Brexit betrayal and to change politics. He's a board member of Tickets for Troops, an organisation that supports our military, as does the Brexit party. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Robert Rowland. Please welcome to the stage, Robert Rowland. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for that rousing reception and it's truly wonderful to be back here in Surrey, a place I used to call home from the age of 13 when my parents moved down here from Manchester. I have been a businessman, a risk taker, an entrepreneur for over 30 years and I've left politics for others, not any longer. Four weeks ago, I offered to help Richard, our chairman, and Nigel in this fight to save our country. I helped the Vote Leave campaign during the referendum, and I'm proud to say I'm a tungsten tip Brexiteer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is a great nation. I am standing for the Brexit party because I believe in British exceptionalism. We are bursting with creative talent. We have the ability to thrive as a confident, sovereign nation, open to all, ready to trade freely with the whole world. But if Brexit fails, we cease even to be a democracy. 
the duplicitous professional political class will have prevailed. The last three years have seen Britain's establishment, the civil servants, the majority of MPs from both parties, academia, the judiciary, and of course, let's not forget the BBC. <laughs> do their damnedest to delay, diffuse and dilute Brexit. Parliament has abolished the referendum and declared war on the British people. There may, be, there may not be tanks on the streets, but make no mistake, this is a coup against democracy. The, the abject failure of Theresa May's government to deliver on the referendum is not only born of hopeless incompetence, it was deliberate. Ther Theresa May never wanted to leave the EU in the first place. She backed Remain, even if, motivated by personal ambition, she spent most of the campaign hiding behind the sofa. We've seen Great Britain utterly humiliated, and we've been completely outmaneuvered by the unelected apparatchik Barnier, his thirsty sidekick, John Paul Drunker, <laughs> and their German and French paymasters, who treat us with undisguised contempt. Mrs. May is entitled to humiliate herself. She is not entitled to humiliate Britain. She, she has lied repeatedly to her party, to Parliament and the British people. Yet her own party shamefully sustains her in office. The British political caste is rotten to the core. They hold the British people in contempt. None of the options they have put forward means Brexit. We need people who aren't from the political class, who will stand up for Great Britain's interests, as Nigel Farage has done tirelessly over the years. <laughs> Most of our Brexit Party candidates, me included, have never stood for office before. We are free from the stench of institutionalised duplicity which clings to the other parties, no change, UK included. <laughs> the Brexit Party is the only serious party that is devoted to upholding the 2016 vote to leave the EU. We intend to implement the British people's democratic, positive and inspiring decision to end our nation's membership of the European Union. We need to tell the politicians in Westminster and the civil servants in Whitehall that their time is up. They have failed, failed the country, failed ordinary decent voters. Vote for the Brexit Party and send them packing. Vote for the Brexit Party and change politics for good. Well done, well done, Robert. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Robert. Robert is typical of so many of the candidates that we've had. We were overwhelmed with people wanting to be candidates, many of whom with, many of them with no political background at all. People with real life experience, so thank you, Robert. Okay, our next speaker, a journalist. She describes herself as a cat lover and a passion for Formula One. And she says she wants to challenge the Remainer slurs with a positive Brexit agenda. Please welcome to the stage, Alexandra Phillips. Please welcome to the stage, Alexandra Phillips. date introduction. Um, I'm not here for that, believe me. Well, you guys all seem really nice and normal. I was expecting little horns and cloven hooves. I mean, I know I've got leopard print shoes and it's pretty much the same thing, right? But, you know, how did we get here? 
How did this room of people end up so demonized? It's four decades of unrivaled propaganda from Brussels. I mean, the myths that they spread, the fear that they build, that they're the absolute and without them will crumble. I'm here to help you guys set the record straight. It's great. <laughs> okay. Now let's start with our young people. I mean, all of those brave enough to turn around and, they, and say they support Brexit are going to face a tough time, aren't they? So we've got to help them out a bit. They say, we're stealing their futures by taking the UK out of the EU. Hold on a minute. Aren't we not giving our leaders of tomorrow complete control over their own destiny? Would they rather the architects of the Eurozone crisis that saw millions of young people put out of work in the Mediterranean, do they want them to run their country for them, make their decisions? What about, hold on, what about studying in European universities? They won't get to do that anymore. But hold on, hold on, hold on, no, no, it's okay. Erasmus has 34 member countries and 22 partner countries. That's a lot more than 28 member states. It should be 27, by the way, we know that. And let's not forget, of course, the Large Hadron Collider, the European Centre of Nuclear Research, that's 200 metres underground, below Switzerland. <laughs> but it, if it's not the universities, we're going to be sending them back up chimneys, right? Because as the Labour Party say, if we're not in the EU, our labour rights are going to go right down. We actually have some of the best welfare standards the best working standards, brilliant animal welfare standards for those who care about that, in Europe. And actually, with the freedom to make our own rules and build our own economy and control our labour market, we can actually be an exemplar to the rest of the country, co continent and get those standards even higher. My final topic, which is my number one favorite topic, is trade. I became a Eurosceptic living in Africa. I'm representing right now cultural appropriation. Um, a, a, a friend in Kenya made me this, and I love it. But, you know, this whole idea of being in a customs union, that is a nightmare. It's awful. The way that trade is done internationally has not changed since colonial times. We see 30,000 corporate lobbyists representing companies like Nestle and Pfizer in Brussels, in the corridors of power, making the decisions, allowing the EU to trample over the developing world just to big up their profit margins. Brussels is a one-stop shop for the corporate cartel of big business and big banking. <laughs> but you know what? The UK is in a unique position, isn't it? Fifth largest economy in the world, pivotal in the Anglosphere, and with the wonderful network of the Commonwealth Group of Nations. If any country can lead by example and take the opportunity that Brexit will give, not just to improve lives in the UK, but actually let Britain lead the way in lifting other people out of poverty with real free trade, real respect. We might be leaving the EU but we are opening ourselves up to the rest of the world. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the other side of Robert. Thanks, Alexandra. I love that line. We may be leaving the European Union, but we're opening ourselves up to the rest of the world. And that's what we want. We want a globally engaged, free trading Britain after Brexit. Um, I'll tell you one thing, folks. See, I love that guitar riff that they play when you walk on. Uh, do you reckon they could get that made into a ringtone? Uh, I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to have that. Talk, talking of music, did anybody watch Eurovision from Israel last night? <laughs> even, even, I mean, nobody, they don't vote for us, do they, you know? I mean, even Australia, you know, came above us, and they're not even in Europe. Uh, 
Maybe, you know, do you think we should Brexit? Maybe we should, actually, I like Eurovision. You know, I'm a bit torn about whether we should Brexit from Eurovision as well. I think it's a great show. Okay, so are you ready for another speaker? Okay, so our next speaker is an author and journalist. He's campaigned really hard and really well. He's a very thoughtful, well-written guy. He wrote an article recently about how at fashionable London dinner parties, Brexit is the love that dare not speak its name. <laughs> and, and he asks, what have our MPs actually achieved over the last three years? A, a very good question. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Bartholomew. Please welcome to the stage, James Bartholomew. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, it's actually quite intimidating to see so many of you here. And that it's, it's representative of something that's happened all over the country. There have been these rallies all over the country, and every time they've been sold out with thousands of people. And I think it's rather wonderful because it shows how many people, including you, are committed to democracy. And you have this nice feeling that on this occasion, I mean, one's not always right, but on this occasion, there's a strong feeling we are absolutely on the right side. Yeah. It's, it's a feeling that is increased by the knowledge that Tony Blair is on the other side. But I think this is a moment almost to feel sympathy for the candidates for the other parties. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, just, just think how tough it is to be a Tory candidate. I mean, did you see that picture in the Daily Telegraph on the front page? They were miserable at the start. And then Theresa May arrived. <laughs> I mean, what have they got to say? I mean, imagine, you know, if you're a Tory candidate, what can you say? Uh, vote for me because we will? No, no, scrap that. We, we, we can? Well, actually, maybe not. We might possibly, if it was a fair wind, we might possibly have a, 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 a sort of non-Brexit Brexit, a brino. What a message to have to come out with. And then, if you have tears, prepare to shed them for the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> yes, no, it's just think how awkward it is for them to have the word Democrat. <laughs> they, they are trying to overturn the biggest democratic vote in British political history. And then there's Labour. Poor, apparently they now want a second referendum. At least, actually it's more complicated than that because there's been a you know, behind closed doors deal between Tom Watson and Jeremy Corbyn, so they do want a referendum. It's quite complicated. As far as I can understand, they want a second referendum if it's a Tuesday. <laughs> Maybe Wednesday. So, we, we, we Brexit candidates, and there's more to come, we're very lucky. Because we actually believe what we're saying. We're clear. We believe in it. We have conviction. I believe...
Like most of them, and like all of you, I suspect, I believe in democracy. Yes. Yes. I believe in, in respecting the results of the referendum. Yes. And I believe in Britain. Well done, James. Very good. Thank you, James. Thank you. And I think clarity of message is one of the things that has really helped us in this campaign. And uh, James is absolutely right. Uh, you know, I, um, I've always found Tony Blair a very reliable political indicator. <laughs> if, he, if he's for something, it's definitely a bad idea. Okay, so, uh, time for another speaker. Now, this speaker, don't be, don't be too intimidated, but our next speaker is doing a master's degree in EU law. She founded Ladies for Leave. She was on the march to leave from Sunderland to London. I don't know if any of you were on a bit of that or you went along. And she says, Labour and the Tories have had three years of resisting Brexit. Their time is up. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Belinda De Lucy. Please welcome to the stage, Belinda De Lucy. That was incredible. What a team we make. All 17.4 million of us. We stood firm. I'm so, so proud of the people of this country right now. And a huge shout out to those who voted Remain, but who are Democrats first and who are joining us. I want to thank Nigel and Richard and all of those who set up the Brexit party. Thank you for providing a peaceful, diverse and brilliantly positive political home for millions of us voters who have been so badly mistreated by the parties we trusted. We had nowhere else to go. Thank you. So two years ago, I was a stay-at-home mum to my four girls, working on my masters, but like millions across the UK, my deep sense of fair play and trust has been rocked to the core by the appalling reaction of our political class to the referendum result. So I began making homemade placards to stand outside Parliament. I know some of my fellow protesters are here with me tonight. <laughs> um, and in between the school runs and university lectures, I would stand there every day uh, as the sight of EU flags constantly dominating the news and, and Remainers stealing our narrative on, on who we were, gammons and racists and why we voted, didn't know what we were voting for, um, thick, stupid. Um, it was a shameful attempt by them to overturn our vote by no less than bullying. Uh, what a tactic. It's not working out well for them though, is it? <laughs> Proud. I'm so proud we are fighting back. So I met this wonderful lady called Mandy Childs on the march to leave from Sunderland to London. And for me, she sums up the British Bulldog spirit. The British Brexiteers walked for hundreds of miles on blistered feet through all weathers to bring the forgotten leave towns of the north down to Westminster. And she said to me on, on very sore feet, Belinda, we don't walk on our legs and our feet for this. We are all walking with our heart and soul. And that for me is the British Bulldog spirit that's getting us here now. I know. How 
how our political elite have forgotten who we are and what we are made of. And to those that mocked our march and our numbers and stalked us the whole way, yes they did, sneering and laughing at us as we trudged through mud and up and down hills, well, and I'll take this line from you, Nigel, they're not laughing anymore. <laughs> I like so many of you, I like so many of you are fed up, but I'm not fed up with Brexit. Brexit hasn't even been implemented yet. How could I be? I'm fed up with the constant propaganda, the deceit, the games, the talking in abstract. I'm spending so much time on our knees. So to all those who have supported and attended the rallies, to those who have leafleted and campaigned and stood firm in the face of insults and bigotry, you are all now the heroes of this new dawn, this bright and brilliant democratic movement. And it will be because of you that when future generations go to the ballot box, their voice will still count and trust in democracy will still flourish. It is because of you that the powers are returned from an unaccountable commission to our, our own parliament so that our future generations will have a greater say in the laws that they have to live under and where their taxes go. Every time in our history that there has been an attempt to reform democracy, there is resistance from government, but the people always win. <sighs> It is no longer about Parliament versus the people. It is about positivity versus pessimism. It is about faith versus doubt, universe, unity versus division. And courage has called to courage everywhere. And who, here you all are. Let's vote for the Brexit Party and change politics for good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Belinda. You know, uh, quite a few of us have felt politically homeless, haven't we, the last few years? I think it's fair to say. And ever since the referendum three years ago, it's been a bit of a Ramonathon, hasn't it? Well, not any longer. Not any longer, folks. Okay, so let's have another speaker. By the way, all these speakers are on your ballot paper. When you see us, we're under the Brexit party, so start with a T, not a B, so we're nearer the bottom. And all of the speakers that you're hearing tonight are named on the ballot paper, headed, of course, by Nigel. And the results are coming out Sunday evening, so don't, don't look for them Friday morning. Okay, so our next speaker, he is Hampshire born and bred. He's in business, and he loves to quote the late, great Tony Benn, who said this, and I think it's so important. The vital thing about democracy is that, you've got, is that you've got to be able to change the people who govern you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Actually, they, they do say that governments and nappies need to be changed often and for the same reason. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Chris Ellis. Please welcome to the stage, Chris Ellis. This isn't a natural room to clap a Tony Benn quote, but, uh, <laughs> but you can't disagree with that. He said a lot of uh, insightful things which uh, apply today. Um, by the way, if anyone has any milkshakes they want to throw, <laughs> now's the time. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll just crack on. The headlines today illustrated, I think, our treatment, which we can take that we've had over the last several weeks. Um, a name check at the top of the Times, it Labour this, Tories that, populist surge, not Brexit party, populist, not popular surge. We're always ists, we're racists, we're fascists, we're populists, but we don't trade insults with Remainers. If we did, we might call them... Uh, <coughs> 
federalists, elitists, aromatherapists, probably <laughs> most of them. But uh, but since they're not here, um, the main uh, I really had two things I wanted to say. There've been some fabulous speakers, and I'm a competitive guy, and I know when I'm beaten, so I'm not going to. Uh, so I left my big speech behind, but but. The two things I really wanted to say was, uh, in particular, in, uh, I'm from Hampshire, and, and most of my campaigning has been in different parts of Hampshire and further north, too. But we had the most amazing, amazing group of volunteers in Hampshire, from teenagers uh, who turn up again and again and again to people even as old as me. And so I just want a quick big thank you to all the Hampshire organizers in particular. You've been fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> We had uh, an interesting time in Winchester yesterday. I have to admit, I slightly, I lived very near Winchester and I was avoiding it because I knew what a Remainer city it was and the Lib Dems have just got in and I was, and it's kind of home turf and I was feeling a bit chicken, but on, we decided we've got to do it. So we did it yes, on Saturday. And we got all the sort of hissing from Remainers as they went past. There, there was a Morris dancing competition going on <laughs> just 10 yards from our stall and uh, where the Remainers had set up on a, uh, a monument that belongs to the council, and the council had told me specifically, you can't use that, but you can go somewhere else on High Street. And we turned up, and there were Remainers plastered all over the uh, bus across. So um, they were drowned out by the Morris dancers. But the, <laughs> the, the hissing and the, the sort of furtively spraying us with lavender oil and all the sort of nasty things. <laughs> uh, but. But it was, a, it was very cheering to see, and also slightly disheartening, leavers who did come by and wanted to signal their support. A lot of them didn't really want to sort of plaster themselves with badges and, and take leaflets, but they'd sort of say, oh, we've already voted, we're with you. But they'd keep walking. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I think it, it is, there was a lot of pressure, pressure there. But then yesterday afternoon in Southampton, there was a... Uh, uh, a march, and I just wanted to just take a second on that because there were, I don't know, a few hundred people there. There were dozens and dozens of handmade placards, just like Belinda was talking about. People have put hours into this, and it was a it was a, a rally and a march, and there was uh, there were a number of speakers, all all leave, plus two conservatives who claimed to be leave as well, and um, and there was a lot of and. I got up on the, on the soapbox, got the biggest cheer and all the rest of it, and I was thinking, well, that's nice, this is all about me. But it's not, because I was there as the Brexit party, party, and what I was doing, which is a real privilege, is wearing the skin of all of their hopes and aspirations and anger and all the things that have got us here today, have got us doing what we're doing, all the disenfranchised, um, who have been abandoned by the establishment were representing them and were standing up uh, for everything that uh, they're feeling denied. So, on that note, it's flashing red at me, let's get, uh, let's get Thursday over and done with, let's blow the doors off and let's get the job started. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, campaigning can be fun, and uh, you know you do meet all sorts uh, when you're out there. Uh, and indeed, yes, Chris, let's get the job done. Okay, our next speaker, like Anne Whittacombe, he has stood for Parliament before. He believes in democracy and has returned to politics to stand up and to fight for democracy. And his final comment to me when I said, "What do you want me to say about you?" He said, I'm returning to politics with the Brexit party to get the job done. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Kennedy. Please welcome to the stage, John Kennedy.
My friends, I love Britain. You all love Britain. And Britain loves democracy and its sovereignty, and it wants its democracy back. Four years ago, the Prime Minister of the day, David Cameron, told us we were having a referendum. He said it was a referendum that was going to sort this question out once and for all, and all of us better beware, because there would be no second vote, no second chance. If we voted to leave, we would leave, and the government would campaign against it because it would be the end of our country. And we needed to know what we were doing, and we were told by the government at the time that if we voted to leave, unemployment would rocket, the pound would collapse, the markets would be constrained, and the British economy would go into a death spiral. And as if that wasn't enough, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, not a commentator, the man that writes the rules and writes the budgets and collects the taxes, told us that it would be so severe a mistake the suffocation of Britain would be so great if we voted to leave that there would be an emergency budget the next day, not the day after we left, but the day after we voted, and that there would be an austerity on austerity budget, and it was touch and go as to whether we could survive. So be careful, they told us. If you vote to leave, there will be no turning back. You will leave. And we still haven't left. Is it any wonder? No one believes a word that they say. And what has happened after three years? They've got the answer. They got the answer from 17.4 million people. Mrs May went and said, I'll ask Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn and Mrs May working on the Fisher-Price Guidebook to Treaty Making. <laughs> well, you've read the result of their talks, but I could have told you that before they ever sat down together to open the discussion. They cannot, any of them, escape, and the Parliament has been a disgrace. The Parliament that, first of all, enacted the legislation to hold the referendum, Parliament that then enacted the legislation to move Article 50. Parliament that does not agree with its own constituencies and constituents and thinks that we are all so stupid that they will not see that their highbrow discussions failing to deliver are anything other than trying to reverse the democratic decision of the electorate. They told us... If you remember, they told us that we were the thick and the dead. But we're not dead and we're not thick and we're still here and they're going to get the same result on Thursday, if not even bigger. But on Thursday... <laughs> on Thursday, what we have to do, all of us, is take nothing for granted. Every single one of us needs to vote. All of the members of our families, our friends, and everyone we know that is going to vote. And I've met people out campaigning who have voted to, voted to remain but will be turning out to vote for us because democracy matters more to them than reversing a decision that's already been taken. So let's send back on Thursday a roar. A roar that is so loud that it will shake the doors in Downing Street, it will rattle the windows in Whitehall and in the chancelleries of Strasbourg and Brussels, and they will be no, under no doubt. We want out, we voted out, and if they won't let us out, we will kick all of them out. The word on the street, the word on the street is we are going to win. Now let's go and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, John. Yes, and it's great to see people who've been out of politics for a while coming back because they feel so passionately uh, about this vital topic. So, our next speaker, he's in business, he lives in Surrey, and he recently told me that he had his front teeth knocked out playing football, but he's still been on the campaign trail. That is how committed your Brexit party candidates are. So please give a big welcome. Please welcome to the stage, Matt Taylor. Please welcome to the stage, Matt Taylor. It's intimidating, it sure is. <laughs> For the last 30 years, I've been working with small businesses around the UK. And seven years ago, I set up my own business. And what a privilege it's been to have that freedom and to create jobs for others. But all that time, uh, I've been a quiet person. I've kept myself to myself, I've kept my opinions to myself on politics. But I just can't do that any longer. I, and, you, and you know what has got me and made me stand up here and get out uh, in a place which is certainly not quiet. It's the betrayal of Brexit. So I'm a student of history, uh, and as you look back, you realize that the elites have always tried to keep the people down. Yeah. Our ancestors fought and escaped little by little from that power. And there was a huge milestone in 1928 when all women got the vote, and therefore all adults had the vote. But that, that, that's only 90 years ago. Our democracy is still young and we still have to fight for it. But now they call it representative democracy. And representative democracy means that the representatives can do what they like. And I say no, that's not democracy. In democracy, the people are the power. Now, most of my adult life, the politicians have been engaged stealthily in giving away our power. They even want to give away control of our armed forces. And it makes me think of that old, old story, I don't think it's taught or, or read anymore, about Gulliver who found himself in the land of Lilliput, asleep, as it was, on, on the beach. And he got tied down by a thousand tiny ropes. I say the people of the UK are like Gulliver. We've been tied down by the politicians. Yes. But the good news is I can see that we are awake. We are strong and we can throw off those ropes. Now, every day in business, uh, I'm reminded that the customer is king or queen. The customer is in charge and businesses that don't do what the customer says they fail. And in politics, it must be the same. Yeah. 
The people have the power, and if the politicians won't do what the people want, then the politicians must go. So my time is nearly up. I just want to add my voice to this message that we are going to send to Westminster, to everyone around the world. We want to say we lent you the power and you've given it away. You said you would respect the referendum result and you've betrayed it. But now, that game is up. We are all going to send a message, and we're going to send it loud and clear on Thursday by voting for the Brexit party. OK, time marches on. So now our final speaker before Nigel. And uh, he works in IT, he lives in Berkshire, and he's done some fantastic work at Royal Holloway College with some of the Brexit supporting students there. Please welcome to the stage, Peter Wiltshire. Please welcome to the stage, Peter Wiltshire. Good evening, Leavers of Berkshire. Where are you? Yay! Hey, you. And, and Hampshire, and Surrey, and everybody else. Thank you. Um, um, my name is Peter Wiltshire. I own a, and run a payment system software company, and I've been trading predominantly with Germany for the past 20 years. Although I run a company, and I have to be involved in all aspects of management, I started my career in sales, and I'll always think of myself as a salesman first. The first rule of sales is that you're only as good as your product. Well, let me just tell you, the Brexit party is a great product. Yeah. It does what it, what it says on the tin. It has great candidates, successful, diverse people from the left and right. It's hard to be short, you know, in this world. <laughs> And the message is spot on. Respect the 2016 referendum result. Respect a democratic decision made by the country. Respect that decision. Whilst canvassing in the South East over the past two weeks, I've seen huge support for us. People feel betrayed that the politicians haven't delivered a proper Brexit from the EU. There is so much anger and frustration, but what has been so uplifting to see is the public's absolute confidence in this country's ability to thrive outside the straitjacket of the EU. <laughs> the, the, Brexit, the Brexit party is the only party that reflects that confidence in this country. Uh, the second thing I've learned in sales, go back to my sales career, is basic negotiating strategy. <laughs> Always be prepared to walk away from a bad deal. I, I don't think Theresa May, I don't think Theresa May or any of the other politicians or civil servants were on my sales course. It might have saved us 39 billion quid if they had been, but. Uh, uh, another important area of sales is closing techniques. My favourite closing technique is the presumptive close. This is where you assume that the buyer has already purchased your product. If I was to negotiate with the EU, it would go something like this. 
Hello, Mr. Juncker. Very nice to meet you. Um, as you know, we're leaving the EU on the 31st of October on WTO terms. Lovely doing business with you. <laughs> and finally, the most important thing I've learned from my time in sales is don't count your chickens. We've got to keep going right up to Thursday so that we can send the strongest possible message to Westminster the Brexit party has arrived and we're here to stay. Brexit must be delivered. Democracy must prevail. You go right down the end. Fantastic. A very simple and effective lesson in sales and negotiating tactics there from Peter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we now come to our final and our keynote speaker of the evening. Last but by no means least, this man has worked tirelessly and fearlessly for 25 years. He's been the scourge of Brussels. And without him, we would have had no referendum. So before we give Nigel what I know will be an enormously enthusiastic reception, let's remind ourselves of him in action. We have a parliament that is now completely out of touch with our country. I think politics is broken. Our task and our mission is to change politics for good. The Brexit party has been formed because, very simply, the government and parliament do not wish to deliver Brexit. We are fighting back. The whole of our politics needs changing. The two-party system doesn't work anymore. If they thought we were going to give up, they've got another think coming. This country needs the Brexit party, and the Brexit party needs you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage. Nigel Farage. You. Hello, Frimley! I can scarcely believe we're doing this. Do you know, this is now the sixth time that I've stood for the European Parliament. And of course, I was elected back in 1999. 20 years I've served over there. 20 years that I've stood up in that chamber and given my helpful, constructive speeches. I think in a, in a funny way, I've kind of enjoyed it rather more than they've enjoyed me being there. But I honestly and truthfully really thought it was over. I thought I was the turkey that had voted for Christmas. We woke up on that beautiful morning of the 24th of June 2016 and despite everything, 
despite what we'd been told. Remember what Osborne told us would happen. Half a million jobs would be gone. Foreign direct investment would collapse. Plagues of black locusts would descend <laughs> upon our land. They even sent President Obama over <laughs> to tell us we were going to the back of the queue. And despite all the threats, despite everything, we voted to leave. And what was significant was, of course, the government leaflet that David Cameron, remember him? Many have forgotten. He's not worth booing. You've mostly forgotten him, really, haven't you? But Cameron sent that leaflet through every home in the country which said, whatever the result, we will implement the decision. And I kind of thought that morning, well, actually, I think this is going to happen. And then a year later, we had a general election in which Theresa May told us Brexit means Brexit. We're taking back control of our laws, money and borders. Corbyn equally said that they would respect the result of the referendum. And then 498 MPs voted for Article 50 and it went into British law. It was the law of this land that we were to leave on March the at 11 p.m. and I thought that's it we've won it's done and what we've seen ever since then is the most willful persistent deliberate betrayal of the greatest democratic exercise ever made in the history of this country it is a disgrace I could not I could not after 25 years of battling to get that referendum, of helping to win that referendum, I decided a few months ago that this betrayal was inevitable, that we weren't going to leave on that date, that they would just kick the can down the road and go on doing so. And I thought to myself, what do I do? Am I going to stand aside and be rolled over by this career political class? Or am I going to stand up and fight back? And I decided I would stand up and fight back, and that's why I founded the Brexit Party. And in some ways, it's been a pretty incredible journey, because we only actually launched this party five weeks ago. I reckon we've had a pretty good start. Five weeks we've been going and we've managed to assemble a great team of men and women to stand for us. I hope you agree. And I think we've got them worried. I think we've got them on the run. Did you see Mrs May launch her European election campaign the other day? <laughs> there she stood with four of her candidates, all of whom looked like they'd just been taken hostage. <laughs> it was as if they had to pay a ransom to get out. <laughs> Although, of course, Mrs May's good at paying ransoms, isn't she? because she's agreed to give Barney a 39 billion for nothing in return. <laughs> Mrs May said at her press launch, I couldn't quite believe this actually. She said, Nigel Farage can't deliver Brexit. Yeah, that's right. Mrs May said, Nigel Farage can't deliver Brexit. What the hell has she been doing for the last two years? I couldn't believe it. She said, she said he pops up every few years and then goes away again. Well, if I've made one really big political mistake in my career, it is that I did believe when we were promised 
by both of those parties when it went into British law. Yes, Mrs May, I admit, I made a mistake. I did not believe that a vicar's daughter could be so willfully duplicitous with the British nation as you've been. And I'm very sorry to say, Mrs May, and many in your party and the one opposite, I won't be going away anywhere soon until we change the entire British political system, because it's rotten. And then today we saw, today we saw Jeremy Corbyn appearing appearing on my favourite television programme. <laughs> oh, he's really good, that Andrew Marr. You've got to give him credit. No, but pretty good, wasn't it? I mean, the weekend before a national election where there was a new insurgent party called the Brexit Party, which, if you believe the opinion polls, and let's not get carried away, let's keep running to the line next Thursday, but if you believe the polls, You've got a Eurosceptic party that is nearly 15 points in the lead. And what did Andrew Marr have on today as his guests? Five Remainers. And isn't it the same every week with question time? Almost every week, it's four Remainers and one Lever. Still, we haven't written our manifesto yet, but I have a feeling after my appearance last Sunday that the BBC licence fee's risen somewhat up the agenda. Right, so, for the sounds of it, there's no need to focus group that one, is there? We've got that one, that one's done and dusted. But one of the guests today was Jeremy Corbyn, and I thought that when it came to the question of the Brexit party, when it came to the question of Brexit, Corbyn looked like a frightened rabbit. Seven times he was asked, could he please explain what the Labour Party's policy on Brexit is? And he simply couldn't do so. But the truth of it is, folks, little bit by little bit, Labour's betrayal of its own five million Brexit voters is every bit as significant as that that has been done by the Conservatives. You've got Keir Starmer. You've got Keir Starmer pushing for a second referendum. Tom Watson pushing for a second referendum. 180 Labour MPs pushing for a second referendum. But it isn't just the second referendum they're pushing for. They're pushing, as our chairman mentioned earlier, for what they call a confirmatory referendum. So that sounds nice and soft and fluffy and harmless, doesn't it? What it is, is a choice. That's what they're proposing, a choice between the existing European treaties and a new European treaty that will potentially bind us into the customs union in perpetuity. What they are pushing for is a referendum in which there would not be a clear, clean, break Brexit even on the agenda. So maybe it's no wonder that when Corbyn is asked about me and appeared then to physically tighten, I thought, <laughs> He said, oh, well, Nigel Farage has spent the entire campaign attacking European nationals who live in the United Kingdom. I haven't even mentioned them once, and nor would I, or should I, or would I have needed to. They are scared of us, and they should be scared of us, because we've got some good reasons, some good reasons for people to go out and vote for the Brexit party next Thursday. If we win next Thursday, and particularly if we can win big, we will put a WTO Brexit back on the table for the 31st of October. We will. Oh, yeah.
And you know how they all keep talking about this second referendum, the Labour Party now? I see Lord Heseltine <laughs> crept out of the Natural History Museum this morning. <laughs> well, he's not very nice about me either, so it's OK. <laughs> and of course, you've got the Liberal Democrats pushing for a second referendum. Why is it that people who call themselves liberal are now the most illiberal, intolerant, unpleasant people in the whole of this country? They also, of course, have the term Democrat in their title. When Vince was saying the other day, maybe we would simply revoke Article 50. They're neither, but they're pushing basically for a second referendum. And of course, we've got that extraordinary, almost unassailable new force in British politics. <laughs> Poor old Anna Soubry, eh? <laughs> yeah, couldn't happen to a nicer person, could it, really? Anyway. But they're all talking about a second referendum. There are some that even think, in a last bid, desperate attempt to get her appalling treaty through the House of Commons in the week beginning of the 3rd of June. And I say treaty. People keep calling it Mrs May's deal. It is not. It is a new legally binding treaty in international law. It is such a shameful document that it would only have been signed in normal circumstances by a nation that had been defeated in war. That is the extent to which she has humiliated us. Well, another good reason to vote for the Brexit party is because if we win these elections and win them big, we will kill off forever any prospect of there being a second referendum of a subject we've won already. Another good reason for voting for the Brexit party in droves next Thursday is it will end quickly the worst premiership since Lord North lost the Americas. She'll be gone. And if we win these elections, perhaps something starts to matter again. A word that used to matter a huge amount. A word that previous generations felt was so important, that we as a country felt was so important, that we actually made huge sacrifices twice in the 20th century to defend the very notion of democracy. It is democracy itself that has been betrayed. We must fight for it. And, and if we win this, perhaps we'll begin to re-establish a little bit of trust that needs to exist in politics because we say what we mean in the Brexit party and we mean what we say, and that matters. And we demand, we demand, if we win this election, that representatives from the Brexit party become part of the government's negotiating team to get us out on the 31st of October. But whatever happens on Thursday, whatever happens in the weeks and months ahead as this new big deadline of the 31st of October hoves into view, whatever happens, the lesson we've learnt from the last three miserable years, this awful chapter in our nation's history, is never again when the two mainstream parties tell us, trust us, we will deliver, never again will we trust them. And our job actually is far bigger. It's far bigger than just the European Union. What we've got to do is take on 
a two-party system that is letting down this country and they're serving nothing but themselves. We've got to take them on. We've got to bring... We've got to introduce wholesale political reform in this country so that we get a parliament that actually reflects the will of the people rather than a parliament that has done as this one has done and betray the will of the people. We have a huge amount of work to do, but I'm optimistic, I'm upbeat, I'm no longer angry because I'm part of something whereby I believe we can change politics for good. So let's be optimistic, let's be upbeat, let's spread that message. So let me ask you, with just a few days ago, are you with us? Yeah. Will you go out and vote for us next Thursday? Yeah. Will you go out and campaign and tell your friends and family to go out and vote for us next Thursday? Are we going to win a great victory next Thursday? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Wow. I told you it was going to be good, didn't I? He hasn't lost any of that fire. Thank you, Nigel. Well, we've got some questions. We've got some questions for the panel and for Nigel. But disappointingly, Nigel, no marriage proposals. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question, and if this is you, give us a wave. Max from West Sussex. If he's here, thank you, Max. This one, I think, would be for Nigel. How quickly can we prepare the party for a general election? Well, it's a good question because I think the odds, of a, the odds of an autumn general election are much higher now than they were. I'd put them at about 50-50, given where we are at the moment. Uh, as I said to you, we are just five weeks old. Uh, the thrilling thing is that well over 100,000 people have now become our registered supporters, so we are the fastest growing political party, I think, frankly, that's ever been seen because the ones that joined with Corbyn only paid three pounds a pop. Our people are paying 25 quid and they mean it. And I'm very excited about that. Very excited about that. There's a lot to do. As soon as this election is over, we have got to focus our minds on Peterborough. The Peterborough by-election takes place on the 6th of June. Being a new party gives us some disadvantages uh, in that we haven't got data. There's a huge amount of work to do on the ground, but we'll go all out for Peterborough. And as far as a general election is concerned, I can tell you that already through the website, and if you want to apply, it's thebrexitparty.org, already 1,300 people have applied to become general election candidates. I haven't had a chance to do much more and have a quick flick through some of them, but I can tell you they are all of the quality, the calibre and the integrity of the people I'm sharing this platform with here this afternoon. And you can rest assured, we will be ready. OK, thank you, Nigel. Uh, next question is Justin from Wallingham. Give us a wave if you're here. Nigel, any thoughts on Boris? And how will the Brexit party deal with it if he becomes leader of the Tories? Well, look, uh, all this talk, all this speculation about who is to become the next Tory party leader, and Boris is the favourite with the grassroots. And Boris is very entertaining. Of that, there's no question. But back to what I said at the end of my speech. Boris Johnson wrote again and again in his Telegraph article that he thought the withdrawal agreement, the new treaty. He described it as vassalage for our country. He said we'd become a slave state. In fact, he talked about it 
perhaps in even fruitier language, he's good at that of course, but in even fruitier language than I've talked about it. And then what happened? Then what happened on the third time it came back to the House of Commons, having said all of those things and having been talked to about the unity of the Conservative Party, he voted for it. And I would say this, actually, loyalty to your principles, loyalty to your conscience, loyalty to your country should come way above loyalty to your party. <laughs> so the truth is, if Boris or any of the others become leaders, unless they tell us unequivocally they're going to scrap the treaty, unless they tell us unequivocally that they've had a chat with Peter Wiltshire about negotiating tactics, <laughs> and they're going to go and say we're leaving on the 31st of October and that's the end of it. If you want a trade deal, come and talk to us. And do you know something? Learning, having trusted Mrs May after her Lancaster House speech, even if Boris or another leader said that, I still would not believe them. How could I, given the history? Now, here's a great question. Alan from Camberley. And uh, thank you, Alan. Now, many of us in the Brexit party, including myself, have served in the armed forces. And uh, after revelations in the Telegraph this morning, I think this is a very relevant question for Nigel. What would be your stance on Northern Ireland, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans still being prosecuted after all these years? You do it. Just, just give Nigel a break. I think there is a, an unbelievable hypocrisy here. We have given immunity to all the IRA terrorists and our own armed forces, of which I've been escorted ably by one, Dickie Bird, a green jacket, are still vulnerable from prosecution based on a, basically a, an appearance or in a, an area where they were under the command of the Queen and the country, and they should get blanket immunity. Okay, final two questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Robert, for that. Marion from Weybridge, if uh, you're here, Marion. If the Brexit party wins the European elections, what kind of pressure will this put upon Parliament and upon the government? I think Anne Widdicombe summed this up best. And isn't it great to have Anne Widdicombe with the Brexit party? Fantastic. I mean, I tell you what, whatever they, whatever they think about me giving speeches and having a go at Herman Van Rompuy and the rest over in Brussels, just wait till Anne gets there, crikey. <laughs> But Anne's point from the start has been this. She said from the beginning that she believed the Brexit party would win these elections and win them well. She said from the beginning that would then send a message to the Labour and Conservative parties, either go for what the country wants, and what we want is to get this agony over with. What we want is to leave. What we want is to get on with the rest of our lives. That is what the country wants. And her message is, she says, if the two parties don't get that message, don't change immediately to wanting a WTO Brexit, then it's very simple. Either we leave, or at the next general election, they leave. Okay, final question, and it's a very brief one, from Ben from Purbright. If you're here, Ben, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Nigel, what's your favourite beer? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, coming from Kent, I'm bound to say Shepherd and Neem. But, but the truth of it is, the truth of it is, I realised at Christmas that 
I hadn't yet fought my biggest political battle. I could see this betrayal was coming down the line and I realised I had a hell of a lot of work to do in a very short space of time. Um, I don't know whether any of you have been following my activities, but I'm crisscrossing the country on a daily basis, even by my standards, working pretty extraordinary hours. And so, to that end, after 35 years of adult life, not doing very many things that are recommended by the British Medical Association, uh, I have actually been on a bit of a bit of a fitness kick, exercising, and the truth of it is, I'm off the beer until Thursday. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're reaching the end now, but please don't rush away. It's been absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you for coming, you for being involved. Let's have another round of applause for our fantastic candidates. And well done to our chairman. He's great. Really good. Thanks, Nigel. And of course, a massive cheer for Nigel Farage. Up we go. All fills around, that's it. Okay, I think you know the drill. What do we want? Brexit! What do we want? Brexit! What do we want? Brexit. When do we want it? Now. When do we want it? Now. When do we want it? Now. Thank you, folks. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Safe journey home. Very Thank good. you. Thank you. Vote for the Brexit Party on May the 23rd and let's change politics for good.